Time Trippers. Welcome to Christmas Time Tripper Stories with Phil, me, and Johnny. That's me. <laughs> um, have you got a banger to start us off while we're around this warm, a Christmas fire? banger, a Christmas tale <clears throat> for these cold, dark nights that make us pale? Well, I was thinking as we'd recently covered. Scott of the Antarctic and his nemesis Amundsen, who got to the South Pole first. Yes, although so we haven't you... actually released, we haven't released it yet, but we will be covering that. But details, yeah, yeah. details. <laughs> I thought that yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty wintry, pretty festive because there's lots of snow in the Arctic, Antarctic <laughs> areas. So why not focus on what the Christmas period was like for the uh, the Antarctic explorers? Uh, obviously, you had like long periods of darkness and cold, and the crews who have been in these very hostile environments, very cold places, uh, for a long time, they're getting quite restless and anxious and homesick, particularly in the run up to Christmas, because you know they've still got their calendar, they still know Christmas is coming, and yeah, they're just not 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 feeling in the best of moods. So it the was goose around is this... not getting fat. They're certainly not getting fat, no, not if they're on their weird diets of penguin eggs and seal blubber. Maybe seal blubber Turds. makes you fat, actually, but yeah, not 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 the best diet, and yeah, they're thinking I think, of... I don't think they weren't on a diet of penguin eggs, they were, they? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they didn't eat penguin eggs. Well, to more s- fool them, <laughs> because they're a nice big egg, and I bet they're great in a fry-up. Yeah, sorry, carry on. So that anyway, they're, they're thinking about their their Christmas dinner and their family, and they're a bit moribund, which is the opposite of what you want to be at Christmas. So their explore, exploration leaders, they were always thinking around Christmas time, how can I cheer up the crew? How can I instill some festive spirit into them? And one of the first uh, Arctic explorers of renown, a certain William Edward Parry, who was exploring cold places, the Arctic primarily, uh, in the 18th century. He uh, had this idea to battle the winter blues through forcing sailors to perform like calisthenic exercises like star jumps and push-ups on the deck, uh, and also dancing to the barrel organ. So every Christmas he'd wheel out the barrel organ and uh, make the men dance. And it wasn't just like dancing and exercise that he pushed as part of the Christmas entertainment program. <laughs> he also did theatrical entertainment. So he'd uh, he'd get the men to design sets and perform these little skits to each other, just just to lighten the mood, to to keep everything ticking along. Uh, and it was around this time that you get this uh, Arctic. Christmas tradition of pantomimes and also cross-dressing and perhaps not so great blacking up, which we don't really do anymore at Christmas. Well, no. Well, well, quite a lot of people are trying to, to well, do the, that. The, the Dutch do it a bit, don't they? With the Dutch. Peter, but... Yeah, and the Belgians, is it? Belgians. In that... oh. <laughs> Oh, well, there's a, little, there's a who, little bit of lacking up, but we don't. We, we know who's anything. from Belgium, by the way, and who loves gold. I love gold. Merry no, Christmas, gold member. Auric gold member. Yeah. <laughs> um. I don't think he's called Auric gold member. It's that's Goldfinger. Am I getting gold... them confused? I'm muddling up them. <laughs> well, it's. <laughs> What was um, I've been completely yeah. derailed by Goldmember? Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he's by the way, he's called Johan Van der Schmutt. <laughs> Van der Schmutt. <laughs> I know. I know he's got webbed feet. <laughs> so um, sorry. So yes, uh, dressing up, cross-dressing at Christmas time, and pantomimes. It was it was sort of a, a nice way for the crew to bond, to put on a little play, theatrical performance, and a few of the members would dress up as women because there weren't any women on board, yeah. and this would make them feel a little bit more relaxed, more at home, 
Uh, there'd also be some relaxation on the excessive drinking of alcohol. You could gamble a bit. You could sing satirical verses and song. Uh, on the cross-dressing, I've got a excerpt from a New Year's Eve celebration in 1899, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the men of Otto Sverdrup's Norwegian Arctic expedition were entertained by a colleague dressed as an old woman who was representing the old year. And I've got a uh, little quote directly of what people thought about this on the crew. He bewailed and lamented his age and feebleness. He groaned over the young people of the day who were growing more and more intolerant of the old and anxious to be rid of them. And therewith vanished through the door to return a few minutes later the selfsame peddler in his best clothes, as smart as and dapper as possible, with a little black hat perched on the side of his head. Shaven, shining and smiling, he looked like a boy. He was a new year which had come to wish us good luck. Uh, peddler was not an actual peddler. It was the name of the, the shipmate peddler who dressed up as the old woman. But I like this, the, the idea that you're, you're an old, feeble woman, you're the old year. Get out, off you go, be on, be on with you and you come back. Shaven, shining, and smiling. <laughs> An even better Christmas festivity is from a little bit earlier, 1841, uh, where you've got these two expedition ships called uh, Erebus and Terra crossing the Antarctic Circle. Uh, they were captained by a certain James Clark Ross of Erebus and Captain Francis Crozier, the Terror. Uh, do you remember Cape Crozier? With the yes. Penguins? These are where the penguin eggs came from. Cape Crozier, where the emperor penguins lay. Exactly. So Cape Crozier, clearly named after Captain Francis Crozier, who was exploring this area uh, a few years, quite a few years, 60-odd years, 70-odd years before, uh, before Captain Scott's crew were going off in search of penguin eggs. Anyway, I digress. Uh, Francis Crozier and James Clark Ross, uh, they were sailing their ships around this area and it came to Christmas time uh, and they were anchored to a massive ice flow because they couldn't really go anywhere. But the enterprising captains decided they'd lighten the mood by making the men carve like a, a massive crystal ballroom out of the ice. So you've got these ships anchored on this ice flow. I they're going to say a, a massive cock. <laughs> <laughs> get there, don't worry. Um, you got these these ships anchored on the ice floe, like an iceberg, basically, a big iceberg. And the crew carving out this crystal ballroom uh, with a refreshment room, a table of ice to serve drinks. Uh, and then at midnight, they began ringing all the ship's bells uh, to ring in the new year. Um... And the Christmas time, I guess they they rang bells at Christmas and New Year. I mean, there's not a lot to do. There's not a lot to break the silence of solitude that reigned all around, as I said. So, yeah, ringing bells was one thing to do. Uh, dancing. Uh, they had apparently had revelry long into the night, playing their little violins and accordions and things in this crystal ballroom, which I think is quite cool, actually. Uh, we've got a, yeah. a quote from one saying... While some threw snowballs at each other and blew horns, others, full of rude mirth, seized the pigs in the sty by the ear, pinched them until the hapless grunters united their cries in concert with the horns. So you've got this wonderful visage of a, of a crystal ballroom carved into the ice with the ships anchored and the crews mingling, blowing horns, ringing bells, and uh, making pigs squeal. If an animal's being misused in history, or probing hand it's not far behind I, I think this is like a light misuse of the pigs because the pigs are obviously kept on the <laughs> yeah, what's it so for being eaten that make, so what's a little tweak of the ear or ping of the curly tail make the grunters squeal is that what it's <laughs> hapless grunters squeal hapless yes. grunters and uh, yeah they, they carved some some snow women near near the gangway of terror they carved a female figure uh, sitting, <laughs> sitting in posture. I'm not sure what sitting in posture means, but they they ornamented her head with a profusion of ringlets. So yeah, no, no. Uh, I'm imagining classical kind of style, neoclassical kind of uh, business, right? In posture. We we have no record of what this female figure looked like. We we could probably work it out though if we if 
we've researched it hard enough. I'm not su- suggesting you should have. It's other than, of course, <laughs> telling you off, then. You know, I, I like to hope that they would have taken some uh, some liberties and, yeah, some hell. <laughs> suitable proportions uh, to reality. Not, like, gone with comically Couldn't large bit... snow breasts it, or something bet... <laughs> like that. I bet if we could see it, see it now, it would just be, like, this <laughs> shapeless mass with, like, two... <laughs> Two massive <laughs> protruding snow breasts, but like really simple, with like a, a carrot in each nipple. You must do a podcast. I'm afraid it is the only way. Captain Scott writes, I must write a word about supper last night. We had four courses. The first, pemmican, full whack with slices of horse meat flavoured with onion and curry powder and thickened with biscuit. Then an arrowroot, mm. cocoa, and biscuit hoosh, sweetened. Then a plum pudding, then cocoa with raisins, and finally a dessert of caramels and ginger. After the feast, it was difficult to move. Wilson and I couldn't finish our share of plum pudding. We have all slept splendidly and feel thoroughly warm. Such is the effect of a full feeding. So yeah, ni- a nice meal they had. Uh, they mentioned pemmican, which which doesn't sound like like your roast pe- pe- turkey. Pemmican was dried pe- meat which had been broken down, mixed with fat, and made into a paste. Not not pelican. Not pelican. No, I don't think you get pelicans where Scott was. You might be lucky if you find a penguin. Probably don't even find a penguin that far inland. In fact, I'm certain you don't, because like, there are no fish for them to eat. It would be a very lost yeah. penguin if you find it like hundreds of miles inland from Antarctica. Um, but yeah, but they had a nice meal, and this was probably one of the last really nice meals that they had, the last time they really felt content, because uh, as they keep on going, uh, the desperation sets in, people start falling down, cracking their heads on things, getting frostbite, and then they get to the South Pole, they realise they've been pipped to the pole by Amundsen, and yeah, just have a rubbish journey back and die on the way. Uh, on in contrast, Amundsen's having Merry a great Christmas. time. Christmas Eve, 1911, for Amundsen is lovely. The Norwegians um, always uh, are always um, first out the gate with Christmas. Always <laughs> have them. They certainly are, and yeah, it's no different for Amundsen and his four colleagues who are fresh from the conquest of the South Pole. And they, they by the time it's Christmas for them, they've made it back to their Framheim base which is like a lovely little log cabin and they've lit fairy lights and uh, got, got some better food than pemmican and hoosh. Hoosh was a type of soup, by the way, like shitty soup. Um, and yeah, in contrast to the previous year, this Christmas Eve was a little bit more limited because they'd already uh, like used up most of their provisions by this time. They, they've been in the South Pole for a year, they've made it to the South Pole, they're victorious, they're very happy and delighted, so it's a good celebration. But all they have is to eat is a bag of pulverised biscuit, some sausage, uh, mm. some dried milk and a bit of porridge. But Amundsen it Sounds says, good to me. It's be- it, it doesn't sound bad, more than yeah. what I have Amundsen some days. mentions that he doubts whether anyone at home enjoyed his Christmas dinner so much as we did that morning in the tent. One of Bjarland's cigars to follow brought a festive spirit over the whole camp. So, yeah, I, I can see this being quite nice as well. They've achieved something monumental, being the first team to get to the South Pole. They come back, they have their biscuit and sausage and porridge, uh, washed down by a cigar. And, yeah, just, <laughs> just enjoy themselves. So, yeah, stark contrast to Paul yeah. Scott. Even though they ba- yeah, they've basically murdered Scott, I'd say. I'd say that. Now, hello. <laughs> I'll leave that uh, for our listeners to be judged, jury, and executioner whether Amundsen really did murder Scott or whether Scott. Um, no, just he did got a really. hurry. Uh, uh, Scott uh, Amundsen also was uh, more like Santa with his methods, the sleigh. Etc. No reindeer yeah. pulling. Yeah, I but, mean, he but, he didn't haul his but, own sleigh. He used an animal to haul it. Dogs, in this case, no reindeers. I wonder if reindeers yeah. would have been any good in a. Yeah, yeah. Probably. I bet probably he did. Would have been he great. probably Other did than you need to feed them grass, don't you? So. 
not much I grass in Antarctic, and you need to like bring a shitload of hay. So yeah, maybe reindeers don't make sense. You can probably, you know, pack it the hay in a way and eat, make them eat it somehow. <laughs> don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. Stop asking me. I'm ill. Okay, well, tell me a Christmas story then, a Christmas story <laughs> from the past. Um, all right. Okay, so here's my Christmas story from the past. It goes back to 1911 and a lovely chocolate maker called Mr. Hershey. Say hello to Mr. Hershey, Johnny. Hello, Mr. Hershey. Can I, can I give you a kiss? Oh, no, you can't. A man giving a man a kiss? I'm in the wrong time to accept that. Said Mr. Hershey. Famous inventor of the Hershey kiss, and he just doesn't want to give them out, not even at Christmas. Yeah, so Mr. Hershey had a ticket to go to New York with his wife. Uh, But unfortunately, his wife got, got quite ill. So he had to cancel his ticket, which would have probably have been quite, quite a blow. However, can you guess which ship the ticket was for that he cancelled on the 11th of December, I think, 1911? If I have to throw a guess, I'm going to say it's the Titanic. A sweet Christmas indeed for Mr. Hershey. Well, not really, actually. <laughs> The following one, I meant, but it wouldn't be sweet. Well, he might, he might have gloated. Yeah, I mean, he he escaped death, most certain yeah. death, being a man. He wouldn't have been allowed on the boat, lifeboat. So may, maybe it felt yeah, um, a little bit sweet. I don't know how it feels to cheat death. Uh, yeah, I, I imagine Mister Hershey it would have compounded his sense of himself as a great man and a great uh, chocolatier capitalist. One of the last chocolate um, barons, Mr Hershey. Um, that Mr Hershey story was like sourced from the, the depths of my, uh, of my recollections of an article I read the <laughs> You're other gonna day. You're going to say so imagination. <laughs> I feel there was quite a lot of imagination. I don't think I did him any, any service, Mr Hershey. And, I have, and I'm not sure, I think his wife died as well. So it wasn't that sweet a Christmas, even if he had been gloating. Oh. Think how <laughs> difficult it would be for Mr Hershey to exist in the current day when everyone has to declare their pronouns. He would be <laughs> Mr Hershey, him, 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 what did oh, I say, God. him, him. Or <laughs> have you not thought through this joke? <laughs> him and Hershey, is that what you were going to say? Uh, the, Mr. Uh, Hershey, my, him, his. Him, her. Uh, what, Mr. Hershey, him? Yeah, he decided he, his name. Mr. He, Hershey. He, he, him. He, him. <laughs> Mr. Hershey, <laughs> he, him. Oh, God. I, the fact that because we haven't put out any of the episodes so far that are, are actually quite good, the new series, the first thing people are going to get is this Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hershey debacle. <laughs> I don't have to include it. It was literally yeah. a, a one that came to me just now when we're talking no, no, about I'm Mr. Got, Hershey. No, I'm suggesting we should we should include all of it. I'm just, I'm just laughing. <laughs> just yeah, the content is content. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of just basically putting it out um, as is. I think we're all good. Uh, so no, I'm sorry, I'm not. If I sounds like I'm repeatedly chastising you, it's that it's sort of for for some. Oh no, I don't mind uh, the effects. I don't mind. It's fine. Head Chastise head. away. Right. Well, I've got this war story, haven't I? Oh, you do. <clears> I'm <throat> looking forward to this one. The, the Mr. Hershey story was just a little aperitif. To the main story. Oh God! There's, there's been this whole thing about plagiarism on YouTube, and that. Hang on a sec. I don't know why I mentioned that. Actually, forget that. Forget I said anything. Ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba. 
just leafing through my mind. War song. So, everyone's what's everyone's favourite Christmas twentieth century history story? Johnny, do you think? Uh, it's, it's probably got something to do with the Christmas truce, where the troops are in the trenches and having a rubbish time shooting at each other and shivering and cold and artillery going off around them, and then it all stops and they play a game of footy. Exactly, but do you know what the true story is? Um, I thought it was more or less that. Yeah, it is. It is just, it is more or less that. Um, I was joking, a little Christmas joke there, because reading into it, you, you, you would think, you know, so many things, you know what I mean. You'd think Hang that on. it would have uh, some, some cold vomit to be poured over it. Mum doesn't like me saying that anymore. Aye, who better? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm if joking. I say it, it'll be better. <laughs> I think cold vomit's fine. But don't worry, but we'll carry on, because people like that, I think, at home. I mean, I've no evidence of that. I've only evidence of the contrary, but um, I keep losing my place pathetically in the book. Here we go. So, Christmas 1914, on some parts of the Western Front, brought a spontaneous truce for the day. I'm quoting from um, We uh, We Were There, an eyewitness history of the 20th century, edited by Robert Fox, um, who collects various eyewitness accounts. Um, So, basically, it begins from the perspective of Lieutenant Johannes Nyman of the 133 Royal Saxon Regiment, who describes the jumpiness that accompanied the truce and the famous football match that followed. Um, So, uh, initially... um, the Germans hang up little Christmas trees covered with candles, and then the British. The it's mostly it's a Scots regiment actually over the trench, over over no man's land. The Scottish Sea Fourth Highlanders um, see see the Christmas trees and think it's like the beginning of an attack, so start shooting at the Christmas trees. Mm. So that's how it begins. Um, also, there were orders from the high command on both both sides that there should be no fraternizing on christmas day um so it, i assume it must have been a like tradition in in warfare that that sort of happened for them to put out a big thing being like don't don't do this anyway in this one there's some jumpiness but the germans come out first and then the captains make contact with each other and come out in the trench and shake hands. And then the Germans roll out barrels of beer and the Scots and the British roll out um, plum pudding, Britain's good old plum pudding. And they play a lovely game of footy where it is described uh, the uh, that the Germans realised there was truth to the legend that a Scotsman wears newt under his kilt. kilt. Um, because uh, uh, when they ran for the ball and stuff, their kilts they flapped up and revealed their bare bottoms. Not just their bottoms. Probably a a turkey's a, t- <laughs> a turkey's waddle of. <laughs> <laughs> um, backed up scrotum, I'd wager too. I wouldn't have thought the kilt was at all practical to wear in the trenches at Christmas. Or like, at well, least, that... like, you know, you'd f- just put some underwear on, it's fucking cold, though, I'm, surely. I, I'm, gl- I'm glad you say that, Johnny, because I thought that also, and did a little bit of digging into, like, into that, and, but it was that, I think, I think it was banned, either, uh, I think the First World War was the last war where Scottish regiments were sort of allowed to to wear kilts and stuff into battle because it obviously wasn't uh, wasn't always very practical. No, um, oh, it's surely though think... like a summer wear thing, isn't it? Like shirt sleeves, short sleeves, or like you're not going to want to wear a kilt in winter. My assumption, I'm not. I am a little bit Scottish, but. Unfortunately, from the lowlands, only a quarter Scottish and a lowlander. 
uh, so we wear the trousers. But nonetheless, <laughs> like, a kilt in minus temperatures seems like such a silly idea. Yeah, I mean, but they must they must know, know what they do they're doing. But yeah, it was banned uh, for World War Two. Although there are there are stories of regiments etc who still did it maybe i read one of us of, of parachutists even that might have just made that up in my head though um but yeah that's the story of the christmas truce and they all had a lovely game of footy and then uh, they all went back to shooty 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 it's a good one the... yeah i mean i do like this idea of the christmas truce a lot like uh, christmas forging bonds between enemies even and everyone's so happy on Christmas that they lay down their arms but of course for every game of football that was being played there were some who just didn't engage in this at all and were still taking pot shots at each other uh, in fact a quick bit of research tells me 149 Commonwealth infantrymen lost their lives on Christmas Day 1914 Uh-oh. and what about yeah, G- Germans? I don't have a figure for that on, on the source I'm looking at but uh, yeah, you've got examples of, of sniper fire still going on, uh, even in the truce, and people are popping their heads up thinking it's truce, but no, it's not truce, not not from the people on the other side. Like various uh, oh, various privates thought there was a truce, but there wasn't, and then they got shot, and then they start shooting back, and yeah, it's horrible. No it's really tragic, isn't it? And and it, it really ha- it kind of highlights to a large degree how sort of little either like how little either side had a real stake in what was going on that they could just pop out and play football like you don't really get that in the second world war with with the nazis like oh we'll have a break today we'll give you a break nazis for christmas day like there was none of that um i don't think in the in the second world war so it's interesting that when they come together they're like why the why are we shooting each other this is much more fun fun sort of thing yeah, um, yeah, there's definitely quite, quite something tragic. really, as you say, tragic about the whole thing. Like the senselessness of the whole war in general is summed up in the Christmas truce. Like otherwise, uh, in in another life, these people would have been friends and playing football and yeah, just enjoying each other's company. But instead, they're shooting each other, and the next day or the next week or the next month, they're going to be locked in brutal trench warfare. Horrible. Yeah, there's, there's some, we'll come to that, obviously, but there's some descriptions of that I've been reading of when the whole, the whole trench system gets, like, massively uh, artilleried and all the rivers burst, etc., and there's men just, like, drowned in their trenches. Uh, but, yeah, on, Merry, on the, Merry on the Christmas. Christmas Merry, <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the note that it was, uh, despite us trying to, like... Uh, derail ourselves i don't think it is a nice beautiful moment in history that is an inspiration is, to we... us for like world peace and oh hallelujah hold hands play football no, make right. football not make football play football not play war or we'll play play football for a day and then resume resume war for another four years didn't happen any other year then did it i don't know maybe um, actually, I don't know. I assume, I assume not. Right, um, by then, the, probably the hatred and stuff was all ingrained. But the fact it was the war had just started, maybe, yeah, it was still possible to see the humanity in the opposition. Yeah. Um, and they had quite quaint tech at the very, very beginning, obviously, as well. Like be no weapons, and that which by the end of it were like quite bad. <clears throat> bad weapons I mean good we- like you know damaging weapons anyway no spoilers <laughs> Merry Christmas <laughs> Merry Christmas Phil and a Happy New Year um oh yeah I was gonna ramble on for a while but no, probably yeah, no I point I don't think we really need to too much unless you want to ramble unless you feel more to say, yeah. I did have a couple of other stories before you suggested the uh, the Arctic stuff, but they were a bit grim. Like mainly that the uh, the Ku Klux Klan was founded on Christmas Day. 
Oh no! Let's well, if you. No, got sorry, it. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. I think I'm, that's clamor sounded. I think I don't. I think uh, perhaps some of our listeners are up for a grim Christmas story. So welcome to Time Trippers' grim Christmas story. I didn't need to say that. I haven't really done any other research on it, though, unfortunately, other than they were founded on Christmas Day by uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Oh, I, yeah. I'd, I'd probably want to make more of a okay, more of a song know. and dance about it. We can do it for next year, if there's a next year, if we still find ourselves going. I'll, I'll do one on, uh, on Christmas clan members. But I think we've got enough for now anyway, to be honest. Time to go.